Hi, welcome to today's video cast. I'm Dr. Lori Eide, and this video cast is sponsored by Columbia Basin College. And I work in the Teaching and Learning Center of Excellence as an instructional designer. So today's talk is about demystifying generative AI. And I love to start with this quote by Sal Khan, the Khan Academy's founder and CEO. We're at the cusp of being able to use AI as the biggest positive transformation that education has ever seen. I like to quote this because in a lot of my discussions with people who are either faculty, staff, there is a lot of uncertainty out there about AI. And as you've probably seen in the media, um, people are either on the side of embracing it or being fearful of it. And I really want to break down these barriers because, because AI, as you will see, has actually been an evolutionary process. Uh, I call this, let's turn the page. And the reason that is, is because either the uh, AI is being presented as something to be fearful of. And I really feel like this is an opportunity for us to look at AI and see how it can actually be a benefit to ourselves in academia as well as to, for our students. So the objective for today's workshop is to understand the history and current state of artificial intelligence, create chat GBT and Google BART accounts, developing skills in AI prompt engineering and stacking principles, identifying some of the educational uses of generative AI, and understanding how AI and AI ethics applies to students, faculty, and higher ed as a whole. Okay, you have to know this about me. I am a big fan of science fiction as well as science. But one of the reasons that I love this, uh, this image in the movie Matrix, either picking the red pill or the blue pill, is that this is, this is that dichotomy I'm talking about where people are maybe fearful and they don't necessarily want to take a risk with the unknown. And that really is what uh, the Matrix was about, was, was do you want to see the Matrix and uh, take the pill that makes you feel comfortable embracing this. I really um, wanted to share a little about me. And then for you, I actually have a poll that I'd like to have you um, scan and take this poll. It just gives me an idea about what kind of uh, comfort level people are having who are watching this video, whether it's low, medium, or high. So this poll right now, we're not showing anything. But hopefully over the course of the coming months, I love, I hope to build this poll. And I hope after the end of this session, you may actually change your thinking, your comfort level, hopefully will increase after seeing this presentation. I actually have been working in the technical field since I graduated from the University of Washington in the 90s. And my degree is in technical writing, as well as uh, educational technology. So I've seen a lot of um, inventions, a lot of technological breakthroughs over the years. So for me, I, I had a hard time feeling fearful because I've just been around it my whole life. And uh, having been in the industry, in the software industry, and have worked for large companies like Microsoft and Hewlett Packard, and I've um, just found that for myself, the fear um, is really not, I believe, as um, pervasive if you are looking at the history. And the reason why I say let's turn the corner to see the potential of AI as evolutionary in terms of an instructional resource, not revolutionary, because the revolution has already happened. That's I'm going to go into more details about in a few minutes. So what is generative AI? Uh, the definition, generative AI is a machine learning subset of artificial intelligence focused on creating new data 
or context such as text, images, audio or video, and based on patterns from existing data. So as you see in this graphic, this indicates the areas in which AI has already been um, built. And um, this image shows the number of companies that are uh, either have AI products or doing research. And this is from May, 2023. And already that number has doubled at least in terms of um, new organizations and entrepreneurs coming up with uh, ways to use AI in the workplace, as well as um, in our personal lives. So these buckets, I guess you could say that uh, our categories for AI include up in the upper right, there's text, which is the green area, video is the blue area, imagery is orange, code, and that's involving programming, is the yellow, speech is the black, and 3D would have to do with um, computer-generated imagery, and uh, research, of course, is the area that, um, as, as, a re as an academic, I'm always looking at what does the research have to say. So I'll be bringing that into this presentation today as well. Okay, brief history of time. I love Stephen Hawking's uh, book, and I had to bring that in here and play it up a little, play in words with AI as um, looking at the history. Because if you really start to see when the actual revolution, the technology revolution with computers began almost 80 years ago with the invention of computers, and that's machine learning, that is when the uh, four computers which were invented that year 1945 there's been debate about who was first there were different universities around the world um, trying to get to release that invention first so it hasn't really been con uh, inclusive in terms of who the who the university was that invented the computer first but that is about the time when they were coming out and then in the 60s, 1968, is actually when the first onboard computer in, car, in a car came uh, into the marketplace, and that was Volkswagen. In 1971, we had email communications, which revolutionized workplace and personal communications, because no longer did we have to rely on talking on the phone or seeing someone in person, but... Uh, you could send in a message through email, and that was a huge, huge change in the workplace environment, especially. In the 70s, you had CGI, computer-generated imagery, coming to play, especially with, that's when a lot of the science fiction movies really were just uh, starting with CGI and as, as a means of uh, demonstrating special effects and costuming. And I'm going to come back to that in terms of what we have now with uh, with uh, a lot of people feeling fearful that they may lose their jobs. I, um, I like to think that um, CGI, back when I was watching it in the 70s, my some of my favorite shows like Star Trek and Star Wars, uh, all of the costuming was done traditionally by um, costume designers. And I think about that job in terms of how it's changed with CGI. Like what happened to a lot of those people that were working in costuming? Were they, um, where are they now? Maybe some of them are actually working with CGI. Um, but that is an example of a um, an, um, an AI revolution that actually did change the workplace. And it has been since the seventies. So if we look at uh, the future of AI and where it might impact jobs, I use that as an example to say it will. People will adapt, and um, it will offer it will offer opportunities for more different jo different jobs, different variety of jobs, different um, I think ca capacities that we aren't even aware of. And uh, looking forward to seeing what happens with AI and the workplace going forward. 
in the 90s, we had the digital photography uh, explosion with the invention of digital SLR cameras. And then in 2010, of course, is when we had the smartphone. And I often tell people, too, who are fearful of AI, it's like, look at this phone that we're carrying around with us. And that was just hardly over 10 years ago that beforehand, uh, we did not have that technology. So it's another demonstration of how things can come into the marketplace like AI and take us take the world by storm. And then uh, 10 years from now, may not seem as, um, it'll seem more integrated in our lives. Uh, 2014 is um, when Alexa was developed by Amazon. And then OpenAI, which we now know with GPT uh, 3.5 and, and 4.0, that uh, it actually was uh, released to the public in 2015 as OpenAI version 3. And that tells me that uh, that's seven years that it's been around and it's taken a while to get to the level, the technology to where uh, we can actually utilize it more uh, effectively. So uh, those are my, that's my uh, timeline for machine learning evolution. And it's, I like to tell people that um, it's, you know, a long ways from some of the potential uh, virtual reality and artificial life forms that we see in the movies. Um, robotics and nanotechnology are being developed, but it might be another 80 years before we see something that looks like um, an actual life form, such as data from Star Trek or um, uh, the life forms. Uh, one of my favorite episodes was uh, the exocomps, which are those um, brown little machine looking image in the middle of the screen. And um, those life forms, I don't, I can't even predict when we might see something that's actually a life form, but I still think it's a good time to turn the corner from living in fear to living comfortably knowing, not knowing uh, what this technology will bring. So we're going to have a couple labs in this um, in this demonstration, and two of them. Uh, one is with the Bard Google account, and the other is with Chat GPT. So I invite you to work along with this video as we go through, and choose either one or the other to work with. Um, I'm going to give you instructions on how to create an account and you could decide which one you want to use. So with BARD, you want to go to bard.google.com in your web browser. And if you don't have a Google account, you can create one. If you'd not, rather not create one, you can wait and do the chat GPT um, account. Then in um, Google, you want to click the try BARD button. And then once your account is verified, you can log in and start using BARD. If you'd rather use ChatGPT, you want to go to chat.openai.com in your web browser, select sign up, and follow the prompts to enter your information. You'll need a valid phone number and address for this, and also to remind you that uh, the free version is currently version 3.5. You can pay for 4.0, but it is a paid account. So it's up to you if you want the free account with version 3.5 or pay to have the 4.0. Okay, so chat GPT. This is uh, once you sign into that account, you will see a screen that has a left navigation bar. And then down at the bottom, you want to uh, type your prompts. And uh, this is where the next part of this demo, I'm gonna actually go into prompt engineering. And I invite you to keep either your chat GPT or your Bard account open and play along as we go through um, giving some demonstrations of ways to build your prompts to get the best feedback 
response from the AI program. So prompt engineering, the reason why um, we go through this is because when you're typing in the BARD or the chat GPT um, window, basically what you type is going to determine the results that you get. And that's one of the things that is really important to learn early on is that this uh, prompt engineering is actually a way to help you get more clear about the information that you want because, because it's going to return very specifically based on what you type. And I want to give a shout out to one of my colleagues, Jen Carlston. She's a business operation manager at Steyr.Content. She actually um, is the one who uh, prompted me to, to do this vid video series because she uh, made it so simple and easy to understand. And um, I was very happy she was willing to let me share her slides today. And the thing that she starts with is this um, framework. And as you see from this image, that it starts at the top with specificity, and then we go to level, and then context, structure, and size. And it is a continuum, although this part between size and specificity, specificity would be um, broken right here, the circle does not continue because at the point at which you get to the end of this framework, it m sometimes might be easy just to start over if you're not getting the, the information return that you want. And it'll make sense as I go through this, but I did want to point out that although it is a framework that is circular, it's uh, whether you decide to stop and try again from the start is up to you. And, um, I think that's an important distinction to make. So specificity, there is um, the more specific you are in the prompt, the more targeted the response you'll get. So make sure that your prompt is clear and unambiguous. For example, if you type in your chat box, uh, the words tell me about Python, it's going to give you a very broad, very, um, very unclear in some cases response. To be specific, you want to summarize the key features and use cases of the Python programming language for a technical audience. So you can type that in the prompt and see, let's do that to see just how different you will see that the response is. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and use chat GPT for this. And I am going to type, tell me about the Python programming language. And as you see, it's giving me a lot of information, very, very broad, although very specific steps in terms of how to use Python. Now I want to go back and say, based on the prompt that we had, the other more specific prompt, summarize the key features and use cases of Python for a technical audience. So let's type that. So now I'm getting a response that's very specific to the use cases. And as you see, it's more targeted to my particular use as a programmer. Next, in terms of 
Oh, I can use AI, generate prompts. We're going to look at the framework level. So this is defining the audience that you want to specify that your AI response is tailored to. And you can, um, for example, choose a non-technical audience, a newbie audience, uh, someone who's an expert with 20 years of experience. Explain to me like I'm 12, if you really want to have maybe one of your children um, writing something that would be able for them to understand. And then for C-suite executives would be if you're working with um, an organization and you're creating something for an executive level audience. So try it out. So we can say summarize the preamble of the Constitution so that a 10-year-old can understand it or summarize the preamble for the Constitution for a U.S. Senator who has 20 years of political experience. So let's go. Summarize. Handle of the solution for a ten year old. Okay, so as for a ten year old, it says that it's a very simple response, just a couple paragraphs, and it gives a very good overview that is for an audience of a younger child. So let's see what happens when we say summarize the preamble. Yes, I can type <laughs> for a U.S. Senator. As you can see, it's also very short, but it does include a lot more sophisticated language that uh, a U.S. Senator would use, say, for example, when speaking to their constituents. Okay, next in the framework is context. This one is my favorite. So you can ask AI to generate a context like your specific person or experience. For example, you could be a um, ask it to be an actor, to respond as a famous person, a business leader, or a job function. So this time we're going to ask it to rewrite the preamble as if you were a pirate like Jack Sparrow. You could ask it to rewrite it as if you were the CEO of a technology company with 30 years experience. Or what about someone else who's famous, um, an actual person like Mahatma Gandhi? So let's go ahead and try that. We'll try the first one, Jack Sparrow. Constitution as if it were Jack Sparrow. And as you see, it's making some very uh, funny language that's written like a pirate. So it's actually bringing in that voice of a character. And it's I, that I think is one of the most interesting things about AI is how you can actually change the context of the response by asking it to speak as if that it were a character or a specific could be as a specific uh, role in an organization. Next, we've got with the framework, the structure. And this is the format or type of output you're expecting to receive. So maybe you want to do something for school or work related to creating an article or writing a paper. Do you want the format in a tab? or table format? Do you want an outline? Do you want an executive summary, a tweet, code submit list, et cetera? So try it out. So you can ask it to give you a suggested FAQ with answers in a tabular format. 
for your customer service website. You can ask it to write an executive summary about how Microsoft Managed Desktop can be beneficial to marketing company with 50, 150 employees. You could ask it to write the top 10 struggles students face when applying for colleges. So in a sense, uh, this is expanding on what, what's already available in Google search and, or other search engines. But instead of you yourself having to go and read through all of the websites that are returned, this is basically doing a shortcut and creating that for you. So uh, we'll go ahead and skip to the next step in the framework, which is size constraints for length of prompt. So you could also indicate you want something with a certain number of words or number of sentence or um, anything related to numeric, like um, for a sales campaign, maybe you want to send out um, just a certain number to a certain number of customers. And then also it could be time-based as well. Um, you can say, you know, I would like to know in the last 10 years um, how some information has appeared in the marketplace. So for trying it out, you can ask it to generate a script for a 15 second commercial promoting a new fruit flavored sparkling water called Swig or write a series of four short emails, each no longer than 150 words, and each with an escalating sense of urgency to sign up for a free AI prompt engineering workshop being offered at Columbia Basin College, or summarizing the movie Titanic in three to four sentences. So last but not least, I think we showed you the framework at the beginning. And I mentioned that when you get to the end of the framework, which is the size, you can decide at that point if the response is not what you're doing, what you're wanting. You can ask AI to do to go further by either you can start over with your prompt engineering or you can combine It's called prompt stacking, summarizing and simplifying your results. So expanding by asking it's a further narrow down or broaden the scope of your parameters that you're asking or ask it to dive deeper in a topic. And I also love the, um, the idea that specifically if you're using AI for um, assignments in coursework and um, you're a college student, for example, and you need to write and paraphrase your uh, AI response for maybe an assignment is to ask AI to respond with the resources of the citation. Where did it get this information? So that, you know, including information that a student has generated with AI and in a paper is going to be um, as equally effective as including a citation that they found on their own. So it's really great that, um, for example, let's go back to the AI here, is that we can ask, for example, um, if I ask it to write a summary of the preamble, of the Constitution, which we did earlier, I can also then ask it, where did this come from? And it will tell you that it gives you the reference of where the actual information came from. So I think that's important in terms of using AI for higher ed. And I also uh, wanted to share some slides with you that describe some ideas about why what I why AI and what does this have to do with higher ed? And um, some of the benefits that generative AI has for students. I like to start with this quote. AI literacy is the ability for people to understand, use, monitor, and critically reflect on AI applications without necessarily being able to develop AI modes themselves. And 
AI models. And what I like to tell faculty that I work with is how AI can help students actually meet rapidly changing workforce needs. Uh, for example, there are more and more uses going forward of AI in the workplace. It's going to be able to help us do our jobs easy and more effectively, and students really need to be up to date and up to speed with what, uh, how to use AI so that when they do go out on their jobs, they're able to um, market themselves as having been being familiar with these tools. Um, integrating AI to further develop their critical thinking skills. That one's kind of up to debate because there are a lot of people who feel that it takes away from uh, students developing critical thinking skills. And that is a very valid argument. I feel that a lot of our discussions that are happening at our college is at this level. And that dialogue is really critical that faculty and staff have at the college to be able to develop uh, policies for students in terms of academic integrity. And we're really not at a place yet where I could definitely say that we've worked that through, but there is the conversations and that are happening and it's an exciting time to be involved with that. Um, then lastly, the level of the equity center playing field because there are students who will come with more familiarity with AI and access to the tools and the technology. So we as educators have responsibility to make sure that all students have an AI literacy who know how to use the tools and can use AI effectively and without um, damaging their academic integrity. And then also developing AI skills. There is like everything else, um, a Bloom's taxonomy that will help educators define how it is that they're going to allow students to use AI in the classroom. And those skill sets and how they can be used in higher ed include know and explore AI, using and applying AI, evaluating and creating with AI, and then the ethics around AI. And so, as you can see in this table, there are four categories of Bloom's taxonomy, and I will go through each one just so that you can get a sense of how they're used in higher ed. So for knowing and exploring AI, that includes knowing the basic functions of AI and how to use AI applications integrating the history of AI tools, orienting students to the basic elements and limitations of large language models, and identifying relevant AI tools for students to use in courses and when and how to use them and when not to use them. The second item is use and apply AI, which is applying AI knowledge, concepts, and applications in different scenarios, using AI as a tutor, for example, idea generator for students producing assignments. So how are they going to be um, using protect, particularly the prompt engineering uh, taxonomy um, and how to build into review tools for assessing students. Thirdly is evaluate and create with AI. So how do students develop higher order thinking skills by evaluating, appraising, predicting, and designing with AI applications. For example, how they evaluate the bias and accuracy of an AI produced content, how to create with tools that use AI technology, and how to develop AI based tools. Lastly, I think the most important category is understanding AI ethics. What are the human centered considerations in terms of fairness, accountability? transparency, ethics, and safety. And this can be used in higher ed by providing a space for discussion in course specific and discipline specific intersections of ethical AI use. So those conversations that are happening are very important and the forums to be able to 
have opportunities for faculty and staff and students to discuss and uh, outline particular uses that are appropriate and what's not appropriate. And debating these boundaries and application uses, et cetera. And I included a link here at the bottom to an Oregon State uh, resource that has a really excellent place to start. And I'm going to go ahead and click on this link so I can share with you this great resource. So this is the Oregon State University website. They have um, left here a navigation bar with an overview. Um, I linked directly to this Promoting Students AI and Literacy page, but there are also some other pages with advancing meaningful learning in the age of AI, practical strategies, recommendations, and samples. So I highly recommend this website as a place to get some information about using it in higher education. And the top three takeaways, I really hope that this webinar helped you uh, further your understanding of how to use some AI tools for yourself, experiment and test how these tools could impact what students will produce in your course. Second uh, takeaway, including CBCs or any of your college academic integrity policies in your syllabus connecting your own personal AI policy, like what will you uh, agree is acceptable for your classroom with standards from professional industries or networks that you are actually working in the fields of, of how AI can be applied. And then beginning planning your changes in your job, revising your course assignments and assessments, remembering the smallest, most pointed changes make the biggest positive impact for students. So please let me know if this workshop helped to increase or decrease your comfort level of AI when you woke up this morning. And with that, I just say thank you so much for attending my video cast. I hope you have happy AI prompting experiences. And if you'd like to reach me, here is my email and phone number, as I would love to chat more with you. And I appreciate your time and go well into the future. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.